All right, well, we've sorted through your questions. And the first one we have is for you, Dr. Hart. Any thoughts on the role of egalitarianism in 19th century Presbyterianism? Oh, boy. Um, that's a... Uh, it's a big question. I don't know. It, there's nothing there more to... Um, now, perhaps just it has it had influence on Presbyterianism. Well, um, I, I guess the way I try to answer that would be to look at issues of church polity, but I don't recall, um, it seems to me the 20th century is when there's, there's a much more of an effort to include either women or other people in office and also perhaps reformulations of um, what the role of ruling elders may be. Um, and I, but I, I don't really have much to go on. So I have to punt. Okay. Sorry. Well then for you, Dr. Strange, uh, this question is, if democracy is an aberration of history is Presbyterianism an experiment as well? Well, of course, I would say a few things about that. Define democracy. Do you mean what we have on these shores? I wouldn't consider that exactly a democracy. Uh, maybe you're thinking about some things Dr. Hart said particularly uh, with respect to that issue. Um, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what you mean by an aberration of history. If you mean that it's not been a majority report in history, I, I think Dr. Hart said something to that effect, that there has been generally uh, a, some sort of monarchy or oligarchy, uh, not, not a wider spread shared rule in terms of world history. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, that, that in, there has not been that, uh, but that hasn't always worked out very well at all. Um, so I've just, I, you know, it seems like there are a lot of presuppositions possibly behind that question. Um, yeah, it's a, I, I do think, I, I would, I'll say this, I mean, this is a, more of a political view, I think, than a, any sort of a particular theological or churchly position. I tend to agree with Adams, John Adams, um, that the kind of government that we established here, I don't know if that's what you mean by democracy. I wouldn't call it a democracy, um, not in any strict sense, but we won't quibble. If you mean constitutional government as it exists in the U.S., um, I tend to agree with him uh, that it requires a virtuous people. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a distinctly Christian people, but it requires a people of some virtue and discipline. I mean, I think ultimately these things are understood and, and practiced. They're consistently practiced within a, consistent, within a Christian worldview, insofar as the works of the law are written on the hearts of even Gentiles. Uh, that, again, is something towards it, which that would tend to. The point being that the kind of government, the kind of Republican federated government that we have had here, um, does assume, I think, a certain kind. I think I, I don't think uh, Adams is wrong that it assumes a certain kind of of commitment of the parties involved. It assumes a certain kind of level of of understanding and interest, participation. It assumes a, a it assumes a kind of virtue on the part of its participants. Um, that is to say, if its participants are you know, you think of the fall of Rome and all the way that gets depicted. If its participants are debauched and, and not committed to anything and, and, and are, are a society of all takers and not givers, not producers, um, yeah, I don't think this kind of government does work very well. Um, and and it, the, kinds of, the kind of balkanization that we've seen, but again, that's, that's, I don't think that's endemic to the government. And I do think that, that, that this government prefers a certain sort of commitment and approach on the part of its citizenry. 
Um, so I, I guess I guess that's what I would say to that. I mean, there there is a certain a broad sense in which I wouldn't disagree with Winston Churchill. Again, this is sort of a political conviction that democracy is the worst form of government, meaning that in the broad sense, except for every other form of government. What are you saying is the alternative? Are, do, are you asking me, do I think that a monarchy would be better for us or something like that? No, I don't think so. Um, I think greater virtue and commitment to the common weal in the historic sense is a better thing. I think that is to say, um, well, I, I mentioned the one and the many. There's, there's, you've got to have a balance between those two. I don't think a society works uh, if you don't. If everybody's just committed to themselves in the most, you know, um, I certainly don't think Ayn Rand's vision is a good one for society, to be quite frank with you. I think that's, just to take that as an example, which has had a, a curious, to me, and rather distasteful appeal to Christians of certain sorts. I, I understand it, but we, we don't need to ever, I don't think, react. We tend to react so much. Uh, and we all have our pasts. You know, we all have our pasts. And there's a certain amount of getting over our past. So we all react in certain ways. But I think maturity also involves getting over, getting over things. So you don't just go to the extreme with something. We don't always have to do that. We're good at that, I think, in some of our circles. You know, we run from this end of something to the other end of something. I, I, I don't think that's mature. I don't think that's thoughtful. I don't think that's the way we should do. So, um, Dr. Aberration, there was a second part of that question. It was kind of like if democracy is, I think, the, kind of working off the quote from that Dr. Hart gave, is kind of a rare thing in history, is Presbyterianism also a rare thing in history? Well, that okay. Now you're you're taking aberration to mean rare thing, and I'm uh, okay. It could it? It sounds like a judgment, not just a statement of of its empirically being rare. But um, well, I think Presbyterianism is the biblical form of church government. So I think that there was some form of that. I mean, we can talk about this. Uh, certainly in in times of the apostles, the Acts of the apostles. Um, I think if you read Ignatius's letter and the way he sort of talks about three office, how is that seen? That's going to get developed uh, certainly by Irenaeus's time and Tertullian to, uh, Tert Tertullian's time into something like the diocesan bishop. So that's, that's a, that again, what, what, what's your alternative for forms of church government? Uh, I like to say the OPC is the worst church, except for every other church out there. To play off of, uh, to play off of, uh, of Winston Churchill in that sense. So yeah, I, I would say that uh, uh, I don't think Presbyterianism. Um, if you mean is it rare? Uh, well, I mean you had episcopacy of some sort for many centuries. Um, if the bishop's a good man, that's not the worst system ever. But it, you know. Uh, I, I don't think the Bibli I think the biblical system is Presbyterianism. I, I, I don't think, let me put it this way, the Bible does not give us, as I would understand, Calvin says this, I'm sure Dr. Hart would agree with this, the Bible does not prescribe a form, any sort of form of civil government as such. Various forms of civil government would cohere, I think, with, with the civil magistrate being what he's supposed to be. You could, that could be various sorts of persons. Uh, I don't think that's true about church government. I think the Bible has given us a church government. Not in all the details, but certainly in the principles. And I think that's Presbyterial, which would be, I mean, we as Presbyterian and Reform, we have some differences, but we both agree on a Presbyterian, Presbyterial form of government. And I think we do that because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. So. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hart. Why would you say that the URC has been less Americanized and remained Dutch as opposed to the OPC becoming more Americanized and not really remaining just Scottish Irish folk? Um, I'm not, okay. Could you repeat the question? Um, yeah. Why has the URC essentially kind of remained Dutch and not become so Americanized? as opposed to the OPC be not remaining kind of Scots, Irish, 
and becoming more Americanized? Because um, the first way you read it, I thought maybe um, someone was trying to say that the URC has become Americanized. That, that's not what the way you're reading it. Right? Uh, no, I think it's an either or. Right. Why is the URC remained more Dutch? Right. I, I, I think it has to do with, um, one, the waves of Dutch immigration, that there's been a, a, a freshening of Dutch presence th from the late 19th century throughout the 20th century. Um, and, and that's been a kind of reminder of Dutchness to Dutch churches even if they're, they're bringing different expectations from the old country to the new country, whether they're coming out of the, the GKN or the, or the H, what is it, NHK, or even the, 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 the Fragamoff churches or the Christian Reformed churches back there. Uh, that's one. But then two, Presbyterians were very much assimilated early on, I mean, as part of being British. Um, the, the Union of Scotland and England in 1707 raises all sorts of interesting questions, and there's a vast literature that I'm becoming aware of now of British identity, English identity, Scottish identity, and what union sort of means for all this. But in America, they were all English speakers. And if you look at the history of the main, so-called mainline churches in the United States, they're all of Anglo-American background, Methodists, Baptists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, something else, someone else I'm leaving out. But, but all of those are coming out of British Protestantism. And so English speakers tend to think of each other. I know there's a Celtic fringe in, in Britain, but they all tend to think of each other on the same page. So I think it's much easier for Scots and Scotch-Irish to assimilate than it has been for people who don't speak English. Thank you. Dr. Strange, how is subscription similar and different in the URC and the OPC, especially in relations to exceptions and even for members? In the OPC, um, if a man is being licensed and ordained, uh, that's done in the Presbyterian. And uh, am I having a problem here? Um, in the OPC, when a man is being licensed and ordained, he's examined before the presbytery, and he's asked if uh, he's asked about his agreement with uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Larger and Shorter Catechisms, and which is to say, he's asked if he has any scruples. He states what those scruples may be, um, they could be something like, they could be very minor sorts of things like, I don't, I don't know whether um, this passage is locked in the valid New Testament practice. I don't know what to death means. It says we should not pray for people who have said, I mean, I'm just thinking of things that I've heard men say, and they say, I'm not, I don't really know what that means. I'm not sure. So, there you go. I could just do it like this. Okay. Uh, so, um, those are minor sorts of things. Then some men will raise questions about what specific things mean with respect to the Sabbath and so forth. Basically, the bottom line is, though, the presbytery hears what the man has to say with respect to any kinds of scruples that he has. They hear what he has to say, and then they vote, do these... They vote for him, whether to admit him, and if they vote to admit him, what they mean by that admitting of him is that these scruples are not understood to, in any material way, uh, affect the system of doctrine. The Westminster Standards are understood to express the system of doctrine as contained in the scriptures, and so you have here a system, and it's not understood, it's not thought, that everything is of equal importance, everything doesn't affect this. Now, I, I, I'm not sure of a formalized approach to this in any way in the URC. Um, I suspect if a man said he didn't think Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, I don't think that's a deal killer in the URC. 
at least that's been my experience and what I've seen in, in which, which it says that uh, in, in the three forms. So, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a formal way, I'm not aware that the URC permits scruples as such. In other words, you, you say you subscribe these standards sign them. I mean, men have to generally at the beginning of classes and, and synods, they come up and they subscribe uh, really uh, elder uh, delegates and, and ministerial delegates. Um, they, you know, you, so you say you believe the three forms. Then, of course, there's the whole question of what I said yesterday, that the, the three forms really have a, have a heart, have a focus that's soteriological, and, and ecclesiological, um, it doesn't as widely address some of the kind of things as do the Westminster Standards. It doesn't say anything about the casting of lots. It doesn't say anything, you know, about some of the specifics of marriage and divorce and remarriage. These are just examples. So you don't you don't get into those kind of issues. It is the case. I would say the things that men tend to have scruples about in the OPC, generally speaking, you know generally speaking, are, are, from my experience, has been things that are not specified in the three forms usually. So you understand what I'm saying? Where they have issues in the Westminster is the Westminster saying something with a greater specificity than you would tend to find in the three forms. I mean, I don't hear somebody saying, you know, I've got a problem like a Cumberland Presbyterian from 1810 your heart was talking about, you know, well, I've got a problem with the decree of God in chapter 3. I mean, that's some kind of fatalism. Well, that would be the end of his ministerial career. I mean, that would just, uh, there's, that's going to go nowhere. The presbyter's not going to say, well, uh, we might, well, okay, we'll allow that. No. So, you, you, you know, you've got to understand that. I, I think that's why, in that sense, you know, if the URC is getting nervous, legitimate question. You know, are you guys looser on this than we are? I don't think, in, I, 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 I think it's fair to say in real practice we're not really that different because you might allow a very minor thing like Paul on Hebrews. We have those kind of things, but those are the kind of things that tend to be said. Now, I, I would say we've gotten a little tighter on that in some ways in the LPC. In other words, I would say in the 70s and 80s and even earlier 90s, you would have men saying maybe more things that they have differences with. Whereas I'm hearing fewer and fewer of these these days. I think there's a, I, I think there's a bit of a, a confessional, I don't know what you want to call it, if it's renewal or commitment or it just seems like, just seems like you're not getting men who are giving these, you know, longer lists of here's issues I have with the Westminster Confession. You're just, I'm, I'm personally hearing less and less in that in exams. I'm not hearing very long lists, if any. So for membership, that's an easy answer. We don't require, what we require to come to the table of the Lord in an Orthodox Presbyterian church, what we require, in other words, for communicant membership is a credible profession of faith. That is to say, it, in the judgment of the session, person coming to the Lord's table, the person who is admitted into the, the membership of the church as a communicant. Uh, they have to be baptized, so either they've been baptized or they have to be baptized if he's never been validly baptized. Um, but those admitted into the communicant membership give a credible profession, which is to say the session, the elders who interview them are convinced that they have and are in the exercise of saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they trust put it in the words of, of the vows, not in themselves, but in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. What's your practice? You tell me. You're working it out. The URC is, I think that in practice, um, I, 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 I'll, I'll be happy for one of the pastors here particularly to correct me. This is, this is needing some clarification among you. I think the practice in a lot of the URCs, as I understand it, is pretty close to what I just said, that you require a credible profession of faith. Um, and you do not require, the, po the point is, is you do not require somebody to come to the table. 
Right. Right. Correct. Correct. Right. It might be because of that. I mean, there it may be a little stronger in its flavor, maybe. Um, but but I again, I think in practice, it's not that different. I think. My understanding is that there are those, there are some in the URC who, well, I've, t I've had personal conversations with a, few, a couple of people, and I've read some things that people have written. There are a few people who would like something closer to a confessional membership. I, don't, I mean, I'm not saying that's any majority, and I'm not going to give the, you look rather surprised, so I'm not going to give the names of these people. <laughs> but there are, I mean, there are some people in print about a few things. That, that seem to go in that direction, though I don't hear that to be the majority. And the, the history of that among Presbyterians, and I'll, I'll, if you were to press me on this, I'd get quite warm about it. I agree with Hodge and his son, A.A. A. Hodge. That's something I feel rather strongly about, that this is the table of the Lord, and we have no more right to require for someone to commune. We, have, we, we can't require more than Christ would require and that it's sectarian to do so. I know there, it is, there are Presbyterians, the Covenanters again, this is another situation, and the RPC, you know, those brethren, of, of all of their distinctives, I have you know, differing views about different ones of their distinctives. One that I actually take the greatest issue with would be that distinctive, requiring the whole membership to confess or, or to you know, subscribe to confession in order to come to the table. I, I object to that. <laughs> well, I think we'll, we'll hold off on that one just a little bit and uh, go to the next one. This one's for Dr. Hart. And the question is, should the URC look to the CRC's golden days as what they should aim for, and why or why not? Uh, well, it depends on when you think the golden days were. Um, and judging from the uh, summary of, of Cornell Venema's history of the U URC, you might think that 1950s were the golden age for the CRC, but it sounds like they might have had some problems then. Uh, I, I, I think it's always a dangerous thing to, for any group to think of part of their past as the golden days, whether it's political for people who live in the United States, thinking of antebellum America, in my case perhaps, uh, thinking you can return to that. It, it, you can't go backward. Um, doesn't mean you have to necessarily go wherever history is going, but I think it's really difficult to try to recreate um, circumstances in the past. So whenever that golden age may be, I'm, I'm of, a, of a mind as a historian to think that golden ages cannot be um, recaptured. And oftentimes the golden ages aren't as golden as we remember them to be. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Strange. What kind of effects might the British abolition movement, thinking Wilberforce, have on American Presbyterianism? I believe the thought is here, the whole issue of slavery in the Presbyterian church. Did the British movement have any effect on us here? Well, um, th yeah, that's an interesting question from a number of perspectives. Um, it, I, I mentioned that the um, Scottish church, the free church, um, I, particularly I'm thinking of the free church here, the free church and the old school Presbyterian church came to have a very close relationship. Uh, Charles Hodge, for example, and William Cunningham became very good friends. Cunningham was one of the leading lights in the free church. and. Um, Cunningham would stay in Princeton. Everybody would come to Princeton to see Hodge. Hodge had lots of friends, and he, he kept them for a lifetime. Um, and the, the, um, though that church, as I mentioned, uh, particularly having that heritage of 
the Second Book of Discipline and um, certain parts of the whole Scottish heritage. And, and Dr. Hart talked about their, the church being formed in opposition to patronage uh, and all that, in, that was involved there. Um, though that church very strongly affirmed the spiritual independency uh, of the church and thus the spirituality of the church, uh, they also, as I say, wrote a, wrote a very warm letter in the mid-1840s after the 1845 General Assembly uh, decision in the PCUSA, wrote a very warm letter uh, urging the, the church to sort of take the kind of stand that it did uh, again in 1818 against slavery, to take that again and to take it more strongly. Um, the real reason, I think, of course, the church, the church was very, very, and, and, and understandably so, was very concerned. Hodge was particularly concerned with the whole abolitionist movement that it would split the church and the nation. Uh, and that though he preferred gradual emancipation, uh, he was very concerned about that split and, and what it would do to the nation as a whole. Um, the, the, but, but British abolitionism in general, it, or, or, or the Wilberforce movement, there, was a, there were a lot of evangelicals in Britain who were writing and encouraging the Americans in this way. There was a lot of that. Um, and there was some resentment of it. Hodge would write back and say, you don't really understand our situation. You know, I agree with you where this needs to go, but how to get there, you don't really quite get our system and, and the impact that this might have if we did immediately this thing. But this is an interesting situation here, though. Let me just finish it by this. When the war came, um, it was the case, as, as many probably are aware, uh, that, uh, well, Queen Victoria, for one thing, was rather sympathetic to the South. She just felt much more kinship in general. Uh, and the South was more, had a more aristocratic mean. The North were Yankee capitalist industrialists. And, I mean, that, not very appealing to Queen Victoria. Ill-mannered and all that sort of stuff when they would come to see her, you know. Uh, <laughs> so um, she, was, she was rather uh, taken with them. Uh, but after Antietam, as you may recall, in 1862, after that victory, Lincoln was waiting for that victory to issue. He had already drafted and shown to his cabinet that summer the Emancipation Proclamation. And he said, I'm going to promulgate this after the first victory. And Antietam wasn't much of one, but it was enough. But that was, the importance of that can scarcely be, uh, can scarcely be overestimated. Because it is the case that, that France and Britain were still, it was, I think it was, there were still real serious thoughts about either or both of those nations coming in on the side of the South. Once the emancipation, because as they could say, this is just a war between these competing interests in America, and it, it's not, you know, it's not about any great issues. It's not about, that slavery isn't in view to be abolished by the Lincoln administration. Once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, particularly there was a movement among evangelicals in Britain and Hodge wrote them a letter, and he said, you can't, you can't even think, and he also has an 1863 uh, Biblical Repertory and Princeton Review article on this, you can't even imagine now not supporting the federal government, the union of these states, now that Lincoln has promulgated this Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, you know, and I know all the Southern rhetoric didn't free a Southern slave. I know all that stuff. It made the war clearly about slavery. He was, that's what he was doing, and it had a great effect. And it effectively meant France or England would now not recognize the South. They would not recognize the South. Uh, and, but there was no small part of the evangelicals who put a lot of pressure in both of those countries. Hodge had a, Hodge had a lot of friends in France who were evangelical. Both of those countries to not recognize the South. So it, it, it ultimately had some significant play in that respect. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hart, could you elaborate a little bit on the church as an organism and the church as an institution 
and its significance, especially here in America? Um, I, I, well, the church's institute, again, is sort of synonymous with the visible church. Church's organism is in a f sort of synonymous with the invisible church, although to get, it, to get the uh, s deceased saints who are with their Lord now, my parents among them, um, to transform culture is, uh, would be a little difficult. Um, so if we're going to put a lot of stock in the church as organism to, to get out people to be active, we have a problem there with, with uh, those who've gone to be with the Lord. Maybe that's not funny, but it seems a bit of a problem. Um, but I'm not sure what to, more to say be, beyond that. Um, that distinction, um, and I think the, um, the confession of faith is clear about what the visible church is called to do um, and that the means that God has given the visible church to accomplish that end. And the risk of being very, very provocative, but I'll go ahead and just do it. Uh, I mean, one of the ways of trying to, th and I'm not sure if the questioner is, is thinking in terms of neo-Calvinism, but I, I've been struck of late thinking about, is there anything in the three forms of unity or the Westminster standards that would require us to be Kuyperian or, ne or neo-Calvinist? It doesn't mean that it's those, that neo-Calvinism is anti-confessional, but I don't think it's confessional. There's nothing in three forms or the Westminster standards that require that would require us to be transformational. It's an option. It's part of Christian freedom. It's just part of Christian freedom the way it's f I'm free to join the Libertarian Party or the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. I'm not free to join a pagan party. And I'm not free to join the Masons. But, but so, you know, I, 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 I'm troubled by Kuiper's appeal to the Westminster Confession, to the invisible church, to try to use that to get to his cosmological vision when I, I, it's, it's not a required position or implication of, of that teaching. So, um, you know, I guess um, on the basis of what our standards teach, it seems that the church has a definite calling, and it seems that Christians themselves are not covered by the confession because the confession and scripture don't tell me what I'm supposed to do in, in teaching or history or conducting historical research. And that, sen that may seem overly precious in its understanding, but that's the basis of Christian liberty. That if scripture doesn't teach about something, then we have liberty. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. That we are, when scripture is silent, it's another important conviction among old school Presbyterians. Um, but I, I feel that neo-Calvinists take the silence of Scripture or, or run with a reference to the glory of God and just, just run something right through that. that. That's not by any means good and necessary consequence. So I don't know if that's where the questioner really wanted to go, but I took it there. Dr. Strange, you look deep in thought about that question. Did you want to answer it as well? Yeah, I, I, th I think a little bit to, to, to revisit what did Kuiper mean by invisible church in that case. Um, I think what, well, not take it what he's, take what the Westminster Confession says, but he also develops it more broadly. He doesn't explicitly develop it along the lines that I said, at least I'd have to refresh myself on that in him. Uh, uh, in terms of chapter 26, the communion of the saints, which I think would be helpful uh, to broaden out that a little bit. But back to chapter 25, I think what he's invoking there when he speaks of uh, the, 
the invisible church is the church as it exists across the boundaries of the visible church. Um, so we're not all in the same visible church here. We're not in the same particular visible. You've got to remember the, the context in the Netherlands and the way that the, the, way that the church gets seen, the way that the, way that the, the Belgic defines the true visible church. And I think what he's trying to do is there can be, and I think it's arguable that some have taken, you can argue about this with respect to the Canadian reform, have taken the expression of that in a, rather, in a very narrow way, what it means to be a true church and to be in the true visible church. And I think he's trying to be a bit more Augustinian and work that and say, well, you know, are you to, everybody in the true church isn't necessarily part of the same institutional church as it's denominated or federated, ever how you want to put that. I mean, the OPC is a church. The URC is a church or churches, as they prefer to be called. Um, that's cross, that's cross denominational lines. Now, they're both vis part of the visible church, but you see, Kuiper was, they were struggling with that whole question of what, how do you define a visible church? Is there an organic unity or is there a unity to the whole visible church? Well, we don't, he's, and he's a plural, he, he espouses a pluralism. We don't have any problem with that. We don't have any problem. I have no problem saying, I'm happy to say that the URC is a true church, the OPC is a true church, the PCA is a true church, and on down the line. Back at that time, there was a lot of dispute of whether you could speak that way. How can you have more than one true church? How can that be? So one of the ways is when you talk about the invisible church, you're talking about the sum total of all those. Yes, it does mean in the, in the, in the ultimate, those who have gone on, and it also means those who haven't even come, but who are the elect. It means the elect through all the ages. That's what the invisible church means. But all those now living of the elect throughout all the churches are, you know, you have that reality. And I think part of what he's saying is you have, you have the church when it meets in its corporate capacity, but you also have the church when it goes out. In, there's, a, there's a certain organic sense of the church going out and living its life, um, going out and... and and you say, well, those are Christians. Well, yes, but we use. there's also a private use of the means of grace. There's not just a public use. And Westminster is very clear about this. When it talks about religious worship, it talks about per private and public uses of the means of grace. And it's not embarrassed to say that prayer is a means of grace. Not only public prayer, but private prayer. It's very clear uh, in Chapter 21 of Westminster. So... Yeah, I, I do think that there is a fuller expanse, a fuller way that you can speak of that. Um, there's a sense in which, I mean, we sing hymns that talk about this, that we, we meet around the mercy throne. There's a sense in which when we meet, uh, when, when, whenever we come into the presence of God, there is that sense of coming into his presence with all the saints uh, and even angels gathered. But, but yes, that's in corporate worship, and corporate worship is the center and the focus of that. But it's not the exclusive place of that. Um, the, 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 the life lived is a whole thing. Communion, you commune at the table of the Lord, but that's a sign and seal of what is to be a life lived in communion with God and with each other as members of the mystical body. That's, not the, that's the focal point of the expression of communion, but that doesn't exhaust what communion means. And I think that's the kind of thing he's, he's talking about. Now, whether it bears the full weight as Kuiper develops it, of everything that Dr. Hart is concerned about, that's a good question. Uh, and, 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 and I think he does have, there's a lot of argument he has to make there. And uh, so, yeah. This is a question for both our lumper and separator, or perhaps uniter and divider, is should Presbyterians and the Reformed work together on a joint confession? Whoever wants to speak first to that. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first just because you were speaking most recently, Alan. Um, I would say yes. Um, I, I tend to be one of those people who think that, um, not that I don't have any real great respect for the three forms and uh, Westminster. And in fact, I really do. I, 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 I love the Belgic and I love Heidelberg. Um, I think they're, they're, they're 
some ways pithier than Westminster, even though I think the shorter catechism is easier to memorize than Heidelberg. Um, but I, I, I do think that there's a, that there's a, 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 um, a continuity and a vitality to the church in each age. So to illustrate this, uh, we had a debate in the committee on which Alan and I both served, the Christian Ed Committee, when we, when we published the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith and Catechisms about whether, what we would put on the, on the cover, what, what we would call it. And we left out Westminster. We called it the Ca Confession of Faith and Catechisms of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Now, of course, it, it's derived from the Westminster Assembly. And so were we somehow claiming that we had written this and not the Westminster Assembly? No, we weren't claiming that. We weren't trying to be duplicitous. We were trying to say, this is our confession of faith. It's not just something that was back in the 1640s, and it now functions as a kind of encyclopedia that we pull off the shelf occasionally. But though, this is the actual living, breathing confession of our faith. But to make that even more living and breathing, it seems to me, it would be useful for us to begin to write confessions. Now, the contemporary testimony that the CRC produced that's what's going to mean, well, then no. Um, but, but I, I, you know, I, there has been, there have been theological developments since the 17th century. Uh, we may be able to come up with something that would be shorter, or, or, or maybe some things need to be elaborated. I'm really not sure we need a, a chapter on oaths and vows that we have in the Westminster Confession. I think they, oaths and vows made a lot of sense in the 17th century. And it continues to make sense more so, I think, in the Scottish and the Covenanter traditions. But, um, but I, I think more generally, though, to give a sense of our churches being confessional and that we have ongoing confessions of faith that, that express our convictions is, would be a good thing. I think the attempt to do so would be a useful I guess what I mean is we can't say what the product would be beforehand. We've got to see what we produce. But I think the attempt to do so could be beneficial. I, just, I think seeking to do that. I, what I mean is let's try to draft something between Reformed and Presbyterian. I'm not going to say beforehand I'm signing off of it. I'm sure you're not either. <laughs> We've got to see what it says. But it's... it's uh, I think there are many benefits to such a notion. Uh, I think he said most of the other things. And we had kind of a fun one for you, uh, Dr. Hart. There was a question asked for what would be the proper location for reading your most recent book? The beach, the study, <laughs> in bed? The, uh, not on your Kindle. A uh, little bit of a Luddite here. Um, I, I, I think um, wherever you feel comfortable being. Um, uh, no, I, I'm sort of struck, it reminds me of um, a book I've assigned at Hillsdale on, uh, by uh, Vitold Rybczynski, a uh, historian of architecture. He used to teach at University of Pennsylvania, was a neighbor sort of in, in, of ours in Philadelphia. Um, and he, he, wrote, he has a wonderful book called Home, the History of an Idea. And it's all about comfort and about the way in which we um, have uh, made our homes comfortable and the sorts of uh, aspects that, that make a home comfortable. And he, and he sort of does a history of home. And he actually has a big section, for those of you who are Dutch, on the Dutch uh, experience in the 17th century and, and the domestication of certain kinds of comforts in Amsterdam and the like. It's, it's a fascinating chapter, but he also has a section in there on um, on someone sitting on a sofa with, with a hot cup of tea, just at the right level, and the right light. And, and it's this wonderful description of what it would be like just to sit somewhere comfortable and read. So that's the answer. Long, very long-winded answer, but that's where you should read it. And we've got a little time left, so I think we'll go back to the, the follow-up question that we had for you, Dr. Strange. What is the impact on... Um, it was church discipline in regards to subscription. 
Is that what the question was exactly? Well, let me answer the second part. They're not teaching, they're just communicants. They don't hold the teaching office. I didn't understand you to say. Yeah. Well, there's always how that goes on and what that's, what's meant by that. So in, in, in the OPC, for example, the fourth, uh, well, now, now we've split, we've got five membership vows, which I don't actually support, but that's, that's another matter. Um, no, it's that fourth and fifth one. Um, Arthur Chris group in the, in the room right now. Um, yeah, the, the, but the old, the, the, the old basic vow was that you, um, you uh, promised to, submit to the government and discipline of the church in case you should be found delinquent in doctrine or life to heed its discipline. Um, so I would say that that would, that would cover that. Um, you, you promised to submit to the Lord to the government and discipline of the church uh, and should you be found delinquent in doctrine or life to heed its discipline. Uh, that doesn't entail, uh, though, for the member, not the office bearer, and we're strictly speaking of the member, it doesn't entail full subscription by any means because in the book of discipline, now this is the way we handle it, you may disagree with it, I understand that, but in the book of discipline, uh, the standards are not the same for discipline with respect to doctrine for the member and the office bearer. For the member, the, he's disciplined for doctrine, not life, doctrine if he imbibes or teaches or promulgates doctrine that is contrary to credible profession of faith. So in other words, he comes on a credible profession and if in the judgment of the session he ceases to have that or he's doing contrary to a credible profession, then that's it. Now if he's causing up dissension, that's a life matter. That's not simply a doctrinal matter. Say. So there's all sort no, someone isn't free to be a rabble rouser within the body life of the church because that's a that's a that's a do, that's a life that's an ethical issue, and he's not in other ways. So there's all sorts of things. But if you're saying, if he doesn't believe in, you know, everything that's in the confession, and he, we always make it clear to people that you know you're you're, you're submitting to what's being taught, and that's being taught is the confession. Um, so again, there has to be that. If you ask a person a question and say, you know, do you believe in everything here? And he says, no, and he tells you, I don't believe in this, this, or this. If it's, you know, stuff that doesn't affect his credible profession of faith, you're not going to discipline him. Now, if he's, if he's stirring up trouble by it, if he's trying to convince people, that's a different issue. And you needn't require him to do that in order to do that. That's just a false dichotomy to say, well, if you didn't require him to subscribe, you, you can't do any, of course you can do something. I mean, that's just, that's not a necessity. Um, you, you know, that's like saying, that's, that's bad cases, hard cases make bad law. We don't want to make our law based on hard cases. And so because somebody may cause trouble, that's not a, a sufficient reason to say we must require them to confess, to subscribe to confession. You have to positively, I believe, have scriptural warrant for that on its own ground. There are those who would say that they do, and I understand that. I can respect that. I disagree with it, but I respect it. Uh, but you're not caught, you know, if you can't really do church discipline if you don't require that. I simply don't, I don't agree with that. I think you can do church discipline quite well. Well, that brings us to the end of our time today. Um, please join me in giving a thanks to our speakers for all that they've said and done for us.